The Constitution, the remarkable results of economic opportunity. By the American Revolution, our forefathers achieved independence for our tiny nation, plus political and religious liberty for each individual. However, economic conditions had changed very little in thousands of years. Then suddenly, in the short space of 200 years, America experienced a tremendous explosion of human energy, an expansion of wealth, a rise in living standards that exceeded all the economic changes in the thousands of years that preceded our Constitution. Why did this happen? Other countries have had men and women of great talent, such as Leonardo da Vinci. Natural resources have always been available on every continent. Crude oil oozed from the ground in biblical days, and Europe was full of untouched natural riches when Julius Caesar marched north from Rome. What made America different was the magic ingredient of economic freedom guaranteed by the United States Constitution. The Founding Fathers, who wrote that great and original document 200 years ago, knew that economic freedom is just as important as our other God-given individual liberties. Only if you are secure in the ownership of your personal property and the right to choose your occupation, to quit your job and switch to another, can you attend the church of your choice, speak your mind and vote for your candidates without fear of having your livelihood confiscated. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton believed that the right of private property ranks with our most important personal liberties. The right of private property means you can retain the fruits of your labor for yourselves, your families, and your children. The Founding Fathers also understood how securing to individual inventors the right to own and market their original ideas is just as much a part of economic freedom as any other personal labor. The senior delegate at the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin, had invented such useful items as bifocals and a rocking chair, and had discovered electricity by his famous experiment of flying a kite in a storm. Before the United States Constitution, there were no laws that gave an inventor the right to own his own invention. English kings, depending on royal whim, would sometimes grant a monopoly over a product or process. Some American colonies and states had granted a few patents, but each inventor had to obtain a special act of the legislature. Then on September 5, 1787, the Constitutional Convention adopted this provision. The Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. For the first time in history, a government recognized the right of inventors to profit from their inventions, instead of making them dependent on the political favor of a king or legislature. This uniquely American rule is completely democratic. It offers the same opportunity, the same protection, and the same hope of reward to every individual. The unanimous adoption of this provision about inventors occurred a few days after the convention delegates had recessed to watch experiments of the newly invented steamboat on the Delaware River. Almost immediately after our new government was organized in 1789, inventors started making applications for patents. On April 10, 1790, President George Washington signed the Patent Act which established the distinctively American rule that inventions should be encouraged by guaranteeing to every inventor the exclusive right to his invention for a fixed term of years, after which the public is free to use it. The law rejected the idea that patents should be licensed or taxed, as many other countries do. The law requires only that the inventor file a full description of his invention and how it works with specifications and drawings. This right of private property attracted talent and capital to invest in inventions that have given us a fantastic increase in our living standards and made America the industrial and technological leader of the world. No other nation has had such a remarkable series of inventions, but then no other nation has enjoyed the stimulus to inventions provided by a free economy. It is appropriate that Thomas Jefferson was the first administrator of the American patent system. He personally examined all the applications that came before the board. 
Nobody wishes more than I do, Jefferson said, that ingenuity should receive liberal encouragement. Jefferson was a mathematician, astronomer, architect, inventor, and the most versatile intellect of his time. His inventions included an improvement in the plow, which was helpful to farming, a revolving chair, which his enemies accused him of designing so as to look always at once, and a folding chair that doubled as a walking stick. Before Jefferson died, he was able to say, the issue of patents for new discoveries has given a spring to invention beyond my conception. One generation later, the French commentator Alexis de Tocqueville called America a land of wonders in which everything is in constant motion and every change seems an improvement. Let's consider the major inventions that rolled out of the creative minds of Americans in the new climate of freedom created by our Constitution. Hunger was a normal condition of life for most people who have lived on planet Earth, and millions have starved to death in every century. Only the United States has never had a famine, and even our poorest people can eat abundantly. Yet, we started out just as poor as any other nation. At the time our Constitution was written, American farmers felled the trees, tilled the soil, and ground the grain with the same crude tools that men had used for thousands of years. Then, after our Constitution was adopted, things began to change almost immediately. In 1793, Eli Whitney received a patent for his cotton gin, a device to mechanically separate the seeds from cotton fiber. That one machine replaced the hand labor of four dozen men, revolutionized cotton harvesting, and made cotton commercially profitable. This created prosperity for the southern states that grew the cotton, and prosperity for the northern states that manufactured the cloth. Cyrus McCormick of Virginia took farming one big step further when he received a patent for his reaper in 1829. From the dawn of history, grain had been cut with a hand sickle. McCormick's reaper enabled farmers to harvest wheat by machine instead of by hand, so a farmer could harvest seven acres of grain in a day instead of only the half acre he could cut by hand. At first, McCormick's reaper was drawn by horses. Then it was powered by a steam engine. This invention changed the whole world because grain is our most common food. McCormick's reaper came at just the time when the Mississippi River Valley began to be settled. It assured Americans of an endless supply of cereals from the Great Plains of the Midwest. Much of our country's wealth began to come from the amber waves of grain made possible by McCormick's reaper. Today, our grain is harvested by very sophisticated farm vehicles. In 1846, when horses were still the main source of power on the farm, a Midwestern blacksmith named John Deere invented a plow with a steel-wearing surface. This new device solved the problem of soil sticking to iron plows, thereby helping the farmer to plow ahead. Twenty years later, James Oliver of Iowa developed an iron plow with a face that was hardened by being chilled in the mold when it was cast. When Oliver died in 1908, he was the richest man in Iowa, and his invention had tremendously enriched all American farmers. Joseph Glidden of Illinois invented what he called an improvement in wire fences in 1873. Today we call his invention barbed wire. Glidden's ingenuity provided a cheap and efficient way to fence our vast western farmlands. Throughout the late 1880s, American inventors continued their improvements in farm equipment. They invented devices for breaking up lumps in the soil and for planting seeds. They invented threshing machines and combines for processing an entire crop. In 1886, a New Jersey farm woman, Anna Baldwin, invented the first suction milking machine. In the 20th century, steam-driven machines were replaced by gasoline tractors, and the mechanization of agriculture began driving full speed ahead. One of America's most industrious inventors around the turn of the century was George Washington Carver. He invented 300 uses for the peanut, including oil used for medicines and dyes and byproducts of breakfast foods and face creams. And can you imagine a world without peanut butter? 
Carver made the peanut one of our chief crops and greatly helped the economy of the South. When Soviet boss Nikita Khrushchev came to America in 1959, he most of all wanted to see the marvelously productive American farms. When he was taken to a farm in Iowa, Khrushchev couldn't resist saying, where are all the workers? He simply could not believe that one farmer could cultivate and harvest so much land all by himself. Why is American agriculture the envy of the world, providing Americans with an endless variety of fresh foods in winter as well as summer, our grain bins overflowing, and enough left over to feed millions in other lands? It's because of the magic ingredient of economic freedom that has encouraged inventors to create and investors to manufacture such marvelous modern farm machines. The need to communicate between the large distances of our new nation was a tremendous challenge. At the time our country was founded, the fastest way to send a message between one town and another was typified by the horseback ride of Paul Revere. Soon, creative minds began to prove that America is indeed a land of wonders. A pioneer in communications was Samuel Morse, who received a patent in 1840 for what he called telegraph signs, a method of sending messages over wire. His invention made possible instantaneous communication between distant points. On May 24, 1844, Morse himself sent the first telegram from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. It was the famous message, What hath God wrought? Foreign inventors also recognized the value of the U.S. patent system. In 1887, the Italian Marconi received an American patent for his wireless telegraph. Soon we were able to send wireless messages across the Atlantic Ocean. The legendary Alexander Graham Bell received a patent for the telephone in 1876. No other invention was ever taken up so quickly and by so many people. From the first clumsy telephone, over which it was often difficult to hear, and which was manually handled by a crude switchboard, the telephone has developed into one of the most sophisticated and efficient of all our modern conveniences. Now we can direct dial almost anywhere in the world and the speed and the clarity of sound are almost magical. America's greatest inventor, Thomas A. Edison of Menlo Park, New Jersey, gave us the phonograph. To hear the human voice coming from a record seemed like a miracle to Edison's generation. The puzzled look on the dog's face when he heard his master's voice coming out of a record player became a famous advertisement, and the old hand-cranked Victrola became a household treasure. Another of Edison's important inventions was motion pictures. We even have a picture of Edison using the camera himself. It was Edison who created the idea of a laboratory in which a team of people works full time on inventions. Despite only three months of formal schooling, Edison was our greatest inventive genius and patented more than a thousand inventions. In 1868, Charles Scholes, editor of a Milwaukee newspaper, received a patent for the first typewriter, thereby creating a tremendous new source of jobs for women. Typewriters are better and faster today, but their keyboards are just the same. More Americans began to read the printed word after Otmar Mergenthaler of Baltimore received a patent in 1884 for a typesetting machine that could set a whole line of type in one solid block. His linotype printing press made possible the cheap and rapid printing of newspapers, magazines, and books. In the 1880s, George Eastman invented the first Kodak camera. Prior to Eastman, all cameras required a tripod. Eastman's invention enabled amateurs to take snapshots, and millions of Americans have been preserving precious memories on film ever since. You press the button, we do the rest, became a household slogan. The Polaroid camera, invented by Edwin Land, came along in 1947. Then we could take instant 60-second pictures. In 1893, Frederick Ives of Philadelphia received a patent for a photogravure printing plate. Pictures in newspapers became first a curiosity, then customary. 
You remember the line from Irving Berlin's song, Easter Parade, you'll find that you're in the Rota Gravure. In Berlin's day, it was special to see pictures of women in their Easter bonnets in the Sunday newspaper. One of the most remarkable inventors of our time was Chester Carlson, who invented the Xerox copy. That means copying documents by a dry electrical process onto plain paper instead of by the traditional wet photographic process. While working a full-time $35 a week job during the Great Depression, he spent his evenings in the public library and, to his wife's dismay, conducted experiments in their kitchen. On October 22, 1938, Carlson invented Xeroxing when he successfully transferred an image of that day's date onto a piece of paper. It took Carlson 20 years to persuade anyone to invest the money to develop his new idea into a useful product. Then, the first Xerox copier became one of the most successful single products ever made. Today, a copier is as indispensable to every office as a typewriter and a telephone. The year 1907 marked a great turning point in radio communication when Lee DeForest, one of the fathers of radio, patented a vacuum tube called an audion. This tube, which amplified weak sounds, was an invention as great as radio itself because it made possible long-distance radio and television communication. The first musical radio broadcast in history featured Caruso singing from backstage of the Metropolitan Opera in 1910. The entertainment field went through many changes in the early 20th century. In the mid-1920s, Bell Labs developed a new system that successfully coordinated sound on records with a movie projector. In the movie called The Jazz Singer, the famous entertainer Al Jolson spoke a few lines and sang. That ended the era of silent films and started what were called talkies. Vladimir Zworkin demonstrated the first practical television set in 1929. He invented the television tube suitable for broadcasting and the picture tube in a television receiver. In 1947, the transistor, one of the most important inventions of the 20th century, was developed by a group at Bell Labs headed by William Shockley. A transistor is a miniature device to control the flow of electric current. It replaced the bulky and unreliable vacuum tube. Before the 1960s, radios were big and heavy, and when we turned them on, there was a delay before we heard any sound. When radios were made with transistors, they became smaller, lighter weight, and portable with instantaneous sound. Transistors were an essential part of the gigantic expansion of our telephone communication system. In 1940, someone estimated that if telephone usage continued to expand, within 30 years, every woman in the United States would be a telephone operator. Fortunately, automatic equipment replaced telephone operators, and the transistor did the work that those millions of women would have done. The effect of the transistor on computers was even more spectacular. The analog computer was invented by Vannevar Bush in 1930. But for 20 years, computers were made with those big, unreliable vacuum tubes. Then came the transistor. In the 1960s, our engineers learned how to put several transistors on a chip of silicon the size of a fingernail. In the capitalist climate of Silicon Valley, California, new companies competed with each other to develop improvements now, a million transistors can be put on a one-inch square silicon chip. As the size goes down, the speed and reliability increase, and the cost goes down. More than 25 million computers are in use in America today, in offices, schools, and homes. Just as great American inventors developed new ways of talking over long distances, so they also invented new ways of transporting people and freight from here to there. When our Constitution was written, the need to travel vast distances was one of our greatest challenges. In 1789, John Fitch built the first steamboat. He used steam power to propel a rowboat and established regular steamboat passenger service on the Delaware River. 
Another American, Robert Fulton, invented the first practical steamship in 1807. It was a great hit in America, but Europeans didn't understand this newfangled device. For example, Fulton got an appointment with Napoleon to try to sell him on the idea of a steamboat to use in his battles with Britain. Fulton spread out his designs and models and explained how, on a day with no wind, Napoleon could defeat the English Navy of sailboats and then move the French army across the English Channel on steamboats. But Napoleon didn't see the value. He literally missed the boat. In 1849, a young congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, developed an appreciation for inventions and whittled some models with his own hands. In a lecture in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln spoke the much quoted line, the patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. For years, train travel was the principal method of transportation for most Americans. After George Pullman invented the Pullman traveling train car in 1858, passengers could ride in comfort and style. The Pullman car remained a vital part of our transportation system until the 1950s. And it's sad that the younger generation in America will never know how exciting it was to travel in a Pullman. Americans of all ages can still enjoy the bicycle, thanks to Pierre Lalmont, a French carriage maker who took out a U.S. patent on a pedal bicycle in 1866. One of the most important transportation advances of all time came in 1869 when George Westinghouse of Schenectady invented the air brake for railroad cars. This invention enabled the engineer of the train to control the brakes himself using compressed air rather than relying on brakemen. The air brake made it possible for trains to be longer and faster, thus enabling railroads to handle the passenger and freight traffic of our expanding nation. The air brake was soon followed by a patent for railroad car couplings invented by Eli Janney of Virginia. Before Janney, railroad cars had to be coupled by a brakeman going between the cars and manually linking them while the engineer gently pushed the cars together, a very dangerous process that killed or injured hundreds of men. The automatic car coupler saved lives, limbs, and time. Trains improved in comfort and speed as they carried our nation into the 20th century. The automobile age was born in 1899 when Ransom Olds invented the first affordable automobile. Olds conceived the idea of an inexpensive auto for everybody and sold what he called a runabout for $650. It cost $25 more to get a top on your car. In 1898, Henry Ford of Detroit received his first of 161 patents. It was for carburetors. He introduced his Model T Ford in 1906. It was cheap, rugged, and dominated the American market for 20 years. Henry Ford is especially known for developing the modern methods of mass production with interchangeable parts, the assembly line, and finally the conveyor assembly. At first, each driver had to hand crank his car to start it. Driving certainly was made easier when Charles Kettering invented the electric self-starter for automobiles in 1911. Rubber tires immediately became essential for automobiles using a process invented by Charles Goodyear. Today's tires not only have to work for the family, but for sports and industry as well. Rubber is used to make the snug wrap on our lettuce and is essential to pipelines carrying oil across vast distances. When Voyager made its nonstop flight around the world, it used rubber tires. Americans were on the move in trains, automobiles, and streetcars. But Americans would not be tied to the ground when two brothers who ran a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio, took to the sky at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the whole world of transportation took off with them. Solemnly told by the Smithsonian Institution that air flight was impossible, Orville and Wilbur Wright proceeded with their experiments and were among the first to apply scientific methodology to inventions. In 1906, the Wright brothers received a patent for what they called new and useful improvements in flying machines. Their great invention changed our lives. 
Charles Lindbergh's New York to Paris flight in 1927 thrilled the world and dramatized America's world leadership in aviation. Even the helicopter was invented in America by Igor Sikorsky in 1939. Since then, we have made gigantic leaps into the era of modern jets, to the Voyager that flew nonstop around the Earth, to the shuttle that takes astronauts to outer space. From the covered wagons that carried Americans to the western frontier, to the spaceships that carried our astronauts to the moon, is a long way to go in 200 years, farther and faster than the whole world had gone in the previous 10,000 years. But then, those other nations didn't have the magic ingredient of economic freedom, which has stimulated so much creative talent in America. Of all the changes that have come about in America, the land of wonders, none is so dramatic as the change in the comforts of home. For thousands of years of recorded history, most people lived in floorless, windowless, dark little hovels or caves. When our Constitution was written, American women cooked over an open fire, just as women had cooked since history began. Housewives carried water from a spring or well, made their own soap, and made the candles that provided meager light for the long hours of darkness. American wives and mothers in those days not only made all the family's clothes, but they spun the thread and wove the coarse cloth with a spindle and loom like those used by the ancient Egyptians. After Eli Whitney's cotton gin made cotton cloth cheap and abundant, Women no longer had to spend every evening spinning and weaving cloth for their families. Women got an evening off from their duties every now and then. In 1842, Elias Howe of Cambridge, Massachusetts, received a patent for his sewing machine, which he called a new and useful machine for sewing seams in cloth or other articles. And Isaac Singer patented improvements. It is impossible to overestimate how the sewing machine lightened the workload of the average woman. In the 1890s, James Northrup invented the first completely automatic loom, and Whitcomb Judson invented what he called the slide fastener, and we call the zipper. In 1849, Walter Hunt invented the modern safety pin. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like diapering babies in the hundreds of years before the safety pin was invented. Mark Twain was an inventor, too. He received a patent for a self-pasting scrapbook in 1873. This was a series of blank pages coated with gum. He sold 25,000 copies, which led one newspaper to say, that was pretty good for a book that did not contain a single word that critics could praise or condemn. Traditional wood-burning stoves and fireplaces began to be replaced when Jordan Mott invented the first practical coal stove in 1833. Called a base burner, this stove had ventilation so it could burn coal efficiently. Cooking has been getting easier ever since. A distinctive American contribution to heating technology was the radiator invented by William Baldwin. His cast iron radiators brought central heating into the homes of most Americans by the start of the 20th century. The best friend women ever had was Thomas A. Edison, who received a patent in 1880 for what he called an electric lamp for giving light by incandescence. No other invention changed the lives of so many people as the electric light bulb. At the beginning, light bulbs were sold door to door from horse-drawn wagons. By the 1930s, new houses came already wired with electricity. Today, every American home has electric light, and modern kitchens are filled with a dazzling variety of electric appliances, especially refrigerators, stoves, and ovens. When Alva Fisher invented the electric washing machine in 1910, he rescued women from the back-breaking burden of doing the family laundry by hand. Washing machines steadily improved, and we really appreciate those improvements. In 1886, Schuyler Wheeler invented the electric fan, a principal method of home cooling until Willis Haviland Carrier, the father of air conditioning, designed the first scientific system to clean, circulate, and control the temperature and humidity of air. When it comes to keeping cool, Americans can even take credit for the ice cream cone. 
It was invented at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. A process called Frosted Foods was invented by Clarence Birdseye. It was an instant success, and today frozen foods are part of our way of life. Fifty years ago, the Iceman used to come every day and deliver blocks of ice to home ice boxes so we could keep our foods from spoiling. Today's refrigerators enable us to preserve our food for weeks at a time, whereas the daily lot of women in other lands is to stand in line for food and other essentials which are always in scarce supply. Refrigeration enables American women to shop at supermarkets once a week and enjoy perishable produce every month of the year. Meanwhile, other inventions were creating new American industries and the energy to provide power to those industries. J.J. Ritty invented the cash register in 1879, just in time to ring up the profits on one of the greatest decades in the history of inventions. The 1880s gave us the light bulb, the streetcar, the automobile, the pneumatic tire, electrical welding, the steam turbine, the electric furnace, and Nikola Tesla's alternating current motor, which was the start of the electric motor. It was an incredible decade. In 1869, John Wesley Hyatt, a printer in Albany, New York, tried to win a $10,000 prize offered for a substitute for ivory to make billiard balls. What he discovered was celluloid, the first synthetic plastics material to be widely used commercially. It soon was used in making collars, dentures, combs, and photographic film. Leo Bakeland, a chemist of Yonkers, New York, invented the first synthetic resin called Bakelite in 1909. Bakelite became widely used to make telephones and handles for pots and irons, and it laid the foundation of the giant plastics industry. In 1889, Charles Hall of Oberlin, Ohio, received a patent for the first inexpensive method to produce aluminum. This gave birth to our great aluminum industry. Americans devised new and ingenious ways to drive across our nation's rivers. John Roebling invented the suspension bridge used in 1869 to build the Brooklyn Bridge, which became known as the eighth wonder of the world. Captain James Eads designed the world's first steel arch bridge and built Eads Bridge across the Mississippi River at St. Louis in 1874. This railroad bridge opened up our great transcontinental railway system. In 1902, George Fuller invented the first steel skyscraper, the 21-story flat iron building in New York City. His original design was based on a steel cage. Fuller went ahead despite dire predictions that wind and weight would make his skyscraper collapse. Today, more than half our large office and apartment buildings are copied from Fuller's steel cage design. Very tall buildings were built before America was founded, but the pyramids depended on slave labor, and the great European cathedrals depended on religious dedication, and each building took at least a generation to build. It took an American inventor to make tall buildings economical and practical for commercial life, and they became the heart of our modern cities. Nylon, invented by the DuPont Company in 1939, was the first synthetic fabric that was superior to natural fabrics. This great chemical discovery started a whole new industry. It was a great day for women when we started to wear long-lasting nylons instead of fragile silk stockings. The story of how the slide rule was replaced by the pocket calculator is a great lesson in how our American competitive system brings consumer prices down. When the calculator first came on the market about 1970, it sold for hundreds of dollars. Now a powerful calculator sells for no more than a slide rule used to cost. But the calculator does so much more work, so much faster, that it saves years of time in the life of any engineer. The peaceful use of nuclear energy is 20th century America's contribution to energy production. In 1942, Enrico Fermi and several fellow scientists conducted the first atomic energy experiment on the football field of the University of Chicago. Nuclear energy is the cheapest, cleanest, and safest source of electric power today. The city of Chicago, for example, 
is fortunate to get 60% of its electricity from nuclear energy plants. The United States has 90 nuclear plants operating today. Without them, we would have to import billions of barrels of expensive foreign oil to make our electricity. Now, industry is developing new products using lasers. The compact discs can play all our favorite music with perfect fidelity. Who knows what exciting new products will be produced by American industries in the future. Our economic prosperity depends absolutely on our military power to protect it. Our high standard of living and unparalleled prosperity rest inescapably on our ability to keep aggressors from conquering our people, stealing our products, and invading our homeland. American military strength is due not only to the courage and stamina of our fighting men, as they demonstrated on D-Day and time and time again, what has made America superior in military strength is the quality and quantity of the weapons and equipment with which they were provided by a prosperous and supportive nation. Creative men have invented and developed new technologies, new processes, and better weapons. Our great industrial strength has produced new weapons, such as the Trident nuclear submarine, in the quality and quantity needed to meet every military challenge. The same man who created and patented the first important invention after our Constitution was adopted, Eli Whitney of cotton gin fame, was, through the influence of Thomas Jefferson, given a government contract to build 10,000 muskets for the War Department. Before that time, guns had always been built by hand, each part laboriously filed and fitted together by skilled gunsmiths. Each worker made everything from the stock to the trigger. Whitney had an original idea. He thought that if he could make standard parts, then the parts of a gun would be interchangeable and a gun could be repaired right on the battlefield. This sounds obvious today, but it was a new idea when Whitney pioneered it. Eli Whitney built his 10,000 muskets in time for the United States to defeat the British Redcoats in the War of 1812. Whitney had laid the foundation for quantity production of complex military and civilian products. In 1829, Samuel Colt of Hartford, Connecticut invented the first revolver, a six-shooter pistol. He was only 16 years old when he whittled his model out of a wooden block. His six-shooter played a big role in our winning of the West and in our war with Mexico. John Erickson, a brilliant engineer who came here from Sweden, designed the ironclad monitor in time to save the Union Navy in a great battle with the Confederate Merrimack in 1862. The monitor used more than 40 Ericsson inventions. Abraham Lincoln was a great booster of inventions, and the monitor might not have been built without President Lincoln's insistence. In 1861, Richard Gatling of Indianapolis invented the first practical machine gun. Ten barrels were rotated around a central axis by turning a crank so that a strong gunner could fire as many as 1,200 shots a minute. Other Civil War inventions included military balloons, landmines, and torpedoes. Incidentally, Clara Barton was employed by the U.S. Patent Office before she had the ingenious idea during the Civil War of founding the American Red Cross. She was one of the first women employed by the federal government. In 1881, John Holland, a schoolteacher who had immigrated here from Ireland, invented the first modern submarine. The Navy advertised for designs, and his was accepted. His boat, called the Plunger, was a big success. The years of World War I showed the world the American genius of workshop and factory. We made great technological advances in guns, artillery, mortars, tanks, and sea mines. America developed the Liberty Engine for fighter planes and made big advances in radio communications. We made the best gas masks in World War I. Our chemists discovered methods to prevent meat spoilage and to dehydrate foods. And one of the popular products to come out of World War I was instant coffee. Americans ensured victory for the Allies by sending munitions and supplies in time and in ample supply. The inventions during World War II were just as remarkable. Probably the most significant, except for the atomic bomb, was the proximity fuse which explodes without actual contact as it nears its target. 
Americans also played a major role in developing and refining radar, one of the winning weapons of World War II. The creative genius unleashed by the Constitution has been responsible for tremendous inventions to cure disease, save lives, and lengthen the healthy lifespan of Americans to 75 years. Prior to the 20th century, a soldier with a battle wound had a small chance of surviving and had no anesthetics for his pain. By World War II, our servicemen had sulfa drugs, blood transfusions, and anesthetics available for immediate use. When we tried to build the Panama Canal at the start of this century, yellow fever killed the workers faster than they could build the canal. The Americans discovered that the mosquito carried yellow fever, figured out how to control it, and then built the Great Canal. In 1900, Hoffman received a patent for aspirin, still the most widely used painkiller. There was no real treatment for arthritis until doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota discovered a drug that would help. The polio virus killed or crippled thousands of Americans, including President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Polio is no longer a threat, thanks to the vaccines invented by Dr. Jonas Salk and Dr. Albert Sabin. Prior to World War II, there was no generally effective drug to fight infection. Now the great killer diseases, such as tuberculosis, typhoid fever, scarlet fever, influenza, pneumonia, and blood poisoning are routinely cured by drugs. Lives of children and adults all over the world have been saved by the wonder drugs. First the sulfa drugs, then the antibiotics, including penicillin. Nine out of 10 prescriptions today call for drugs that did not exist 40 years ago. Our patent system protects both the inventor and the costly investments in laboratory research that make the wonder drugs available at reasonable cost. Our Constitution gave America a wonderful system for protecting the labor and work product of inventors, fostering industrial and technical progress, and ultimately letting the world benefit from individual genius. We've seen the spectacular results. America has only 5% of the world's population, but our land of wonders has created more new wealth than all other nations in the world combined. The drawings of Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century prove that some great inventors are not American. Leonardo's inventions included an automobile, an airplane, a parachute, a movable bridge, and a multi-barrel gun. But his inventions existed only on paper. Only in America could such ideas actually be built, where men are free to invent and to invest in the certainty that they will own the product on which they pour out their talent, skill, and financial resources. President Dwight Eisenhower said, this system has for years encouraged the imaginative to dream and to experiment in garages and sheds, in great universities and corporate laboratories. Innovations and discoveries have created new industries, giving more and more Americans better jobs and adding greatly to the prosperity and well-being of all. The greatest of all American inventions is the Constitution itself. It was an original design that came from the creative minds of a very remarkable group of men who had fought for liberty, understood how precious it is, and built an instrument that has endured for 200 years. In freedom, the future is more exciting than our best minds can predict. We have every reason to believe that America's next 200 years will be as great or greater than our past, so long as we keep the economic liberty designed by our great United States Constitution. From the east to the west, we're standing proud. From the north to the south, we're standing proud. From the fields to the factories, we'll shout the word out loud. Our Constitution is still standing proud.